My name is Jose Casals, Chef Jose, and I'm a, I'm a culinary instructor here for, for some of you guys that don't know me. <laughs> I'm a chef instructor. And, um, and today is the beginning, the beginning of the Hispanic Heritage Month. And we all celebrate together creating a dish. And I hope that you can learn and then practice and get other dishes, and throughout the month, but not the month. Continue, go back, practice. Let's get other dishes. Let's not just stick to what we know, what we feel comfortable, but explore the region like I do, like I have done in, in my past. Um, many years ago, I, I, I started to travel. One of my goals and, uh, was to, to get to know some of those regions to get to know the foods, the people, going to the market, taste. I'll be honest, not everything that I tasted was great. <laughs> I did, I received some surprises, there was many surprises, and, but it was a great experience going out there, reaching out and picking some of those fresh items and learning. And maybe sometimes I, I, I had the opportunity to cook side by side with, uh, with, the really, with, with the people that do it every day, inside. And it was awesome. Well, today, and uh, we, our group, the Hispanics, and, and I got to say, I, I'm, I'm proud because 20 years ago, and a little bit of my background, when I, when I moved to the United States, you know, I was graduated from high school, first time coming into to the U.S. and learning, having to go to the college, learn English. Cooking was my passion. And I knew by cooking, I was going to be able to go really far. And, and I think I am getting there. <laughs> There's a few more things that, we need to, that I need to do in order for me to complete that goal. And it's going to take me another 20 years. Why? Because I'm still learning. And this is a journey that I started 20 years ago. I love what I do. I think we chefs love to explore, to see new ingredients, to new, do new things, technology, use on our advantages. But when I came, and, um, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a humble guy, pretty humble, I think, chef. Um, that, was, that was my, my aim, my target. And, um, you know, going into what we do and seeing the growth. I mean, today we're the, the largest minority group in the United States. We have to change the culture somehow. We bring a lot of the food, right, into the day-to-day. -day. And we, it is very powerful movement. And it's awesome. However, um, Latin America, and I'm sure you guys are going to ask me, what do you think about Latin America and what are the flavors? Well, wow. <laughs> There's no one flavor. There's no one type of food, ingredient, method. I think it's just, it's a big casserola, you know? A lot of different ingredients, a lot of different, you know, ways, taste, palate. If you start with the North or, you know, Mexico, regionally, we can spend years and years exploring what they do. The moles in the South, carne mechada in the North, Tortas, you name it. Then as you start going south on the central region, Central America, then you have many countries there. You got Guatemala, Honduras, um, Costa Rica, San Salvador, Panama, important regions, and regions that are very diverse with the people, ingredients, and cultures. And we celebrate that. And they celebrate. And as we start going south, we hit um, South America. 
And then we're talking about Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay. I mean, the landscape, the, you know, and, and going back into the ingredients, Tierras Planas in Bolivia, and then when you go into the city, La Paz, you're 4,000 meters above sea level, you feel the difference in the way the people cook and their culture. And then as we go into the Caribbean, we have three important countries, Cuba, Santo Domingo, and Puerto Rico, where I'm from. <laughs> We're very similar, but we do grab a lot of the influences from the Spaniards, from the African that came, and also the Taino Indians. And that kind of transformed into what we have today, plus the ingredients. Now, I, I, I'm sure you guys are wondering, what is he going to cook today? <laughs> and, um, and I also I want to walk through, and maybe we can discuss a little bit about some of these ingredients and uh, some of the, the nice, really, display that we uh, were able to uh, do. And, um, and I'm going to do a dish of... It's called pepian. It's actually, it comes from Central America, from Guatemala. Guatemala is a dear in my heart. I've been there many times. I, I think I started traveling down there in 98, somewhere around there. And I got to go into many different parts, study the Mayan cuisine, going to the, you know, of course, ruins, different departments. There's 22 um, departments, they call them, departamentos, you know, um, like towns, right? And, um, and within all of them, you can explore something new and you learn. So the culture is very rich. And I like that. But there's also many other places. But today I want to share these because it's a method that really explores really essential ingredients that we don't see every day. And those, some of those ingredients, as you can come, we had some ajonjoli, which is sesame seeds. You have them right in here. Um, pumpkin seeds, pepitas, cinnamon. Then we have the chiles, which is the, and I, and I placed some of the chiles up here. We got the guajillo, the uh, arbol, and then pasilla. Then over this side, we're not making it. But this is it's a flor de Jamaica, and we, create, and we do a, a, um, a, a drink, and we celebrate with a flor de Jamaica. It's a delicious drink that we do, sort of like a tea. Very nice. Then as we continue with the ingredients, we have cilantro, avocados, tomatillos that are really known in the whole region, right? Have you ever done some of that really spicy green salsa? <laughs> Now, let me go back to the peppers. Are we, we love peppers, right? Are they all spicy? No, right? There's different intensities, and that's what we look for as we explore with them. There's also a different method. Some peppers are smoked. They're dry smoked. Some other ones are, are, are not. They, they just keep their true meaning. In this case, I have one that is, a, is mild, or the combination, mild, medium, and hot. Now, this one is smoked pepper. So we're gonna, when we get to taste, you're going to taste the smokiness of that one. Right here, this is going to be the basis of my sauce. We're going to take some tomatoes, and I'm going to roast them, pan roast. You want to get some of that, you, you we want to, Try to make them a, or roast them pretty evenly, but we really want a lot of color. And that color will be incorporated into the sauce. Then, part of the sauce, we have some chicken. Now, the dish, you could do it with uh, pork or beef. It's up to you. So, you, at home, if you want to do it, you could use either one. Tomatillos which is the ones that I just showed you, some jicama. I'm sorry, chayote. <laughs> uh, chayote. 
jicama is another ingredient. Put a little cayenne pepper lime. And some carrots. You bring out a little bit of the sweetness into the dish. Now, we have some toasted bread. In this case, you, could just, you can use the French baguette, nice and toast. And this will be our thickening agent. Now, let me start with uh, the first ingredients. And uh, the first thing we do, we're going to take the ajonjoli, and we're going to get the oils out. We're going to roast, pan roast. Most of the time, you see something like this, which is a comal. This is made out of cast iron. And this is where we, they make a lot of the cooking, on the open fire. In Mexico, they do something similar with, that is called mole. And you have different kinds of moles. You could do a dark. You could do a red. So you can play with your flavors. OK. So I'm just going to lay it here for a second. I'm going to do my pepitas. Can you smell that? Can you start picking that with the cinnamon? Well, we, we, we roast the pepitas. We're going to start cooking the chicken. And all we need to do is just a little bit of olive oil into the pan. Can you smell that? Wonderful, huh? And we're going to combine them. I'm going to leave them just to cool down for a few minutes. While that is cooking, we're going to start cooking the chicken. Just simple um, saute method, right? Low amount of oil, high heat, let it cook. Now, while we are cooking the chicken, we are going to roast the tomatoes with the peppers. So I'm going to lower the heat, and then now I'm going to be adding my carrots to the chicken. Chayote. And tomatillos. Just a few. And let them steam. Cook in the pan. Now, now that we've reached a little bit of color, we also toasted the, uh, the chilies. We, now we have a lot of flavor out, the oils coming out. So we're going to add them. Before I do that, let me make sure. Why? I want to puree these flavors, these ingredients. They're part of the sauce. And at the same time, you're going to smell a wonderful aroma you're going to get out of these. And then I will be adding my, the rest of my ingredients. Chili. with a little bit of chicken stock. Oh, we added more in a second. And then now we're going to puree all of those ingredients. Now I'm going to be adding more chicken stock. Pretty thick right now at this point. Also, the French bread. And this is going to be our foundation. 
This is our sauce. This is the basics. You see the color? How it's changed? We really want to let it puree for about a minute or so. Some home blenders, you can time it. So usually you want to leave it like 60 seconds, nice and blend. Chef, what kind of consistency are you trying to get out of that sauce? Um, we're looking for pretty thick. In this case, um, you should be able to almost pick it up. And um, it's, it's a thinner paste. It's a, it's a paste, but uh, for thinner. Now, just on the blender, because we will be adding more chicken stock, so it will become more of a, of, of a, of a sauce. Well, not a runny sauce, you know. It's, so now... All of these ingredients, I'm going to add them into my, my chicken. And some more chicken stock. And we're going to let it cook. Want to work it? And usually, when we serve, uh, when we're going to let it cook for 15, maybe 20 minutes, medium heat, you want to stare, you don't want it to settle in the bottom of the pan and burn. You really want to work those flavors, and then at the end, if you notice, you will and you're gonna be adding your your final uh, salt and pepper. You're gonna adjust your flavors. Now, if you like it really spicy, then you might want to add a more pepper. <laughs> so that is up to you. That 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 is your personal uh, choice. In this case, now, how do we serve uh, a pepian? We can serve it with rice. Um, we can serve it with uh, some tortillas that we can make. Uh, we can serve it with a you know a number of things. Um, in this case, we're gonna serve it with a little bit of brown rice as it cooks. Would it ever be appropriate to add garlic to this? The the dish doesn't call for garlic, but if you do want to add some garlic, um, I would say yes, that's fine. But it's not really a um, the region. They, they, got, they don't embrace garlic. They embrace chilies, uh, lime. Um, they embrace onions. If you want to caramelize some onions and maybe add on the onions later, that's fine. So that's the kind of stuff that uh, they, they like down there. Um, you said that uh, when you add the salt and peppers, when you're actually tasting the dish, if you want to add more chilies, or, uh, more, mm -hmm. do you recommend, are we supposed to roast them and then put them in afterwards or just stick the chilies in to taste? Or? You want to slightly roast the chili and puree and then add it into the sauce because if not you will be eating a whole pot of chili and that will be really spicy <laughs> and did you rehydrate the peppers before you added them in the chili no we just roast them with in the pan and then add them into the uh um into the uh, blender with the liquids so you didn't really need it needed to uh, hydrate them again, like in water, let them boil, because you really want the intensity. You want the full flavor of the chili. You don't want to add on too much water either. Would you deglaze the pan that you roasted the peppers with some of the chicken broth and put it in the, could you do that? You can um, with tequila. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because um, if you wanted more color, you right, you, you can would, do some you color. Use, you can yeah. add on, um, but it's not necessarily a, a method that they use oh, okay. down in that region. Okay. We, as we explore with food, you could do some wine. You could do some maybe white wine or red. In this case, because the sauce is kind of dark. Mm, okay. All yeah. right. Thanks. 
Can you use a sauce raw, like a Mexican salsa, or it has to be cooked, like a condiment, instead of cooking it with the chicken? Well, and these, these sauce needs to be cooked. It has um, to be cooked. Yes, because you got to pull the flavors, and, and then you also want to create a balance. As you cook the sauce, things become more stable. If not, then you're going to have some ups and downs, and your palate is just going to scream at you saying, wow, what, what do you do to me? But, but then again, if you want to do um, a, a, just a salsa and an uncooked sauce, and that's the thing. I mean, when we go down there, um, not every country, um, they have salsas, but all the salsas are different. You have the chismols, you have the, you know, the salsas in the north, you have the pico de gallo in the south. You know, so there's a lot of variations to even that one simple dish. And if you go to Argentina, you got the chimichurris and, you know, so, again, you know, I think it's just really getting to, once we explore the ingredients, we put them together and then add them, you know, combine them with those, some of those dishes. But it's fine. Um, I saw you used whole cinnamon sticks. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend using, like, cinnamon powder or anything like that? If you Looking for intensity. I'm looking for flavor. I'm looking for a pow. When I... When, when you taste my dish, you're going to feel the, uh, you, you're definitely going to be able to taste the cinnamon, the ajonjoli, the pepitas, the pumpkin, all of that stuff, the combinations. And I'm sure you guys are starting to smell all of that as it's, you know, right now simmering in. Chef. Yes. Uh, question. This meal, is, is it something that um, people in Guatemala eat on a special occasion? Or is this like a daily or something that they can eat on a regular basis? Um, it's a heartier dish and, uh, and, and plate, so this is not a, uh, a special uh, Sunday meal. This is really a day-to-day, -day. and uh, depending where you go, the region, then you're going to see the differences in colors and the ingredients. So, you know, into the mountains, you see the pork, um, the, the coastal area, they use all the ingredients, so you see some variations and people love it because remember when you're coming down into the city to work you need a big meal in the morning so it can carry you throughout the day <laughs> i met some wonderful people and sometimes these wonderful people they come from way up in the mountains they take buses it takes them two three hours to get to the city and when they're in the city they work a full day and sometimes it's just not enough so they bring dishes like these with them to eat throughout their journey. <laughs> yes. Um, you said you're making this with brown rice. My family really doesn't like brown rice. Is there any other rice you could really use with this? Or is mm -hmm. brown rice the best for it? That's my uh, choice um, as a chef. But you could use white rice. Uh, long grain, medium grain. <laughs> you could use just about any. Um, even wild rice you could use. You just got to make sure that you don't overcook it because you also have this sauce that needs to be cooked. The, this, the sauce is going to get into the rice. It's going to be part of the coating. It will be part of the dish as well. Yes. Um, typically, uh, what do they drink uh, when they have this kind of food? You know, like. Good question. Um, we have uh, what we call the Rosa de Jamaica, which is a tea. And, and um, we take the, these and we, you know, as we infuse and we make it, we, they add a little sugar to it. Um, you know, you got an orichata, which is a rice-based drink. And then, and then we have some tamarind that they, they usually uh, like to drink. Where can you get the Rosa de Jamaica, you called it? Um, these ones you could get at the, uh, any Hispanic uh, market. You should be able to. They're pre, in fact, I see them at Publix in some places. Yes. Okay. I was asking that uh, since we know what they typically drink in uh, Guatemala and in some of the other countries, you know, with this type of food, I was asking that since we are here in the States and we drink a lot of wine, if there's any particular type of wine that he, he would recommend that would go with this uh, type of food. Um, I think with this dish, it's just it's such a hearty dish. I would go with a medium body. Uh, red, anything along the lines, Mary Shirah or Pinot Noir or, or any of those. Uh, or maybe you might, might want to explore the south, going into the uh, Chile and in and, 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 and Argentina, and then they have the tempra, Tempranillo uh, mm -hmm. grape, which is a great variety of, uh, of wine that they do out there. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it'll go really wonderfully uh, together. Chef, how did you come across this recipe? Oh, wow. Um, many years ago, I was in a town called La Antigua. And La Antigua is known for their candy making. And I came across um, this wonderful lady, Doña Maria. And uh, she sort of reminded me to my grandma, you know, my abuelita, you know, talking about she's just such a bubbly, I mean, so passionate about the, her cooking. And um, Doña Maria would not let anyone in her kitchen. She was very, very proud of what she did. I mean, no one. Um, and I was lucky to, to actually get to know her, talk to her, and we cooked together, which it was one, I mean, an amazing experience for me as a chef you know, at that time. And, um, and, then I, and after we did all that, then we went into this, really, this restaurant in La Antigua. And, um, and she took, you know, all of us, and they served us a pepian. And they served us a whole lot of different dishes that were very regionally from that part. And that was my first engagement with that dish. And it was a wonderful experience, and I just kept it for, for a very long time, you know. So every time that I go back and I go to La Antigua, I always try to go to her place to buy candy and then explore. <laughs> and I do get to go there uh, almost every year, you know. It's a beautiful place um, it's just so you, so you get to know the, the, the area. It's, um, it's a colonial city. Uh, it was the original capital. And um, it's surrounded by three volcanoes. And El Volcán del Agua... Um, erupted many, many years ago. It covered the, the, the town in ashes and dirt. So they had to move the city to what Guatemala City is today. But that whole structure became what is today called La Antigua. And people from all over the world, they go there just to eat and explore and learn it, uh, Spanish. <laughs> so it's, it's a nice place. Um, other places in, uh, in you know, Many wonderful experiences in Honduras, uh, going into uh, um, the Mayan ruins of El Copán. And they have a really nice town in, uh, by the, of El Copán. And they do these anafres with cheese, melted cheese. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, uh, and some chorizo. And, um, and then they put some fresh um, cilantro. And they serve it with chismol. In that case, wonderful foods, wonderful places, and, and that's, that, that's part of the education, you know, going out there and exploring, and don't being afraid. One of the first things that I do, I usually go to the markets. That's, that's, I, I tell them whenever I, I, I go to a country, I was like, Let me, show me your market. Let's go there together. Um, many years ago, I was um, a co-host on a, on, a, on a TV, on a cooking show a couple times, in, um, in Guadalajara. This one is in Guadalajara, Mexico. And we were celebrating the Day of the Dead. And uh, the day before we taped, we went to the market. And oh my God, I mean, it was quite amazing stuff. And the eating, and don't being afraid of tasting and, and getting out and educating your palate. That's really all part of the education. Well, this is going to end this section of my demonstration. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Now, Chef, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what um, you have done, and, um, and, and you know, we... We're here. To, uh, we're really excited to have you here on board, here with us right now. But we want to get you. to know you, and then we want to get to know a whole lot about your culture, your cuisine. Right. Uh, yeah, I attended culinary school in the United States in the early 70s. I went to a community college at first, Cañada College. And after that, I did a, a journey around Europe, uh, learning about the Middle Eastern cuisine and Spanish cuisine. But I always had the Guatemala in my heart. This is where I was born. So after I came back from Europe, I went to California Culinary Academy in San Francisco, and that's where I kind of mastered my studies of the, of the cuisine. I eventually, I came back to my country in 1993, 
And my dream was to make Guatemalan cuisine famous as Mexican cuisine is, as Peruvian cuisine is. I'm still working on that. It's been a very hard labor. But I have done many other things like sharing with people the ability to eat healthier and cook, you know, the more professional way. So I've been running my school for 11 years. In the interim, I also had a TV show that's been on the air for 13 years, Monday to Friday, teaching uh, all kinds of cuisine, international and Guatemalan as well. I also founded the Guatemalan Chess Association and was able to get Guatemala inducted to the WAX Association in 2002. I recently was admitted to the Academy of Culinary of France and I'm glad to, you know, to say that I keep sharing my knowledge with everybody that wants to listen to me. And my goal is to allow my cuisine to occupy a, a good place in the world. Tell us a little bit about the Mayan cuisine and uh, the influences in the region. All right. Uh, the heart of the Mayan cuisine basically is the corn. We have a list, uh, in Guatemala, at least 70 different types of corn. Uh, corn has been grown all the way from Mexico all the way to Peru. But basically, it has been the Aztecs and the Mayans who made it their, their main staple food. And according to the few um, history graphs that we have, the Mayans have always set themselves up a different ways of uh, corn, be it uh, ground in an Atoli way or also cooked like a tamale. So we have classified Guatemala 200 types of tamales. Wow. The tamale being the base uh, corn dog, which then is filled with some type of sauce and some type of meat. Uh, the Mayas were not known for anything, any, any, anything sweet. Even the cacao, which is the heart of the chocolate, was eaten in the natural bitter way. But the Spaniards came in the 500 years ago and they added sugar to it. But before that, the Mayas basically, like I said, ate corn. They complemented the meals with different um, squash and gourd seeds, with different types of chilies, and also with the tomato, of course and a lot of wild herbs. The main meats that the Mayans ate were deer, uh, tepesquintle, which is kind of like a herb-eating a, a mammal, also wild boar, and uh, iguanas, different type of iguanas, and mostly those type of meats, nothing domestic. Guatemalans did, did not start eating uh, chicken or beef until the Spaniards came. So now we have two types of cuisine in Guatemala. If you go to the countryside, Guatemala is divided into five regions, depending on the, on the topographical area. So we have the highlands area, which is where the highest mountains are. And since it's a uh, very cold there, people eat a lot of spicy food, a lot of chili, which is the opposite that if you go to the south, which is most close to the coast, that's the, where the most of the cattle is grown. So they eat a lot of beef there and they eat a lot of fish and some seafood. Guatemalans are not very seaf big seafood eaters. Most of it, maybe some shrimp and some crab. If you go to the um, wet Middle Eastern area of Guatemala, where the most of the Spanish influence was left, then you'll see dishes that are mainly, mainly made with cream. Creamy dishes and not spicy at all. We even have a um, some African influence in our cuisine today because there were some slaves that were brought in the 1700s to the Caribbean coast of Guatemala, uh, which is close to the north, northeast of Guatemala. We have Caribbean cuisine, which is a lot of coconut, a lot of uh, beans messed, messed up with rice, a lot of fish. And there, and there's the only area of Guatemala where you'll find a lot of seafood being eaten. In the central region, which is the city of Guatemala now, is mostly Spanish influenced food. And lately, we also had an invasion of uh, Italian food, so you, saw, you find some <laughs> Italian threads. But to really see the Mayan cuisine, you would need to go to the Highland area. And you see this is like the one we're going to see today, the pepian. Pepian to Guatemalans is what the moles is to the Mexicans. It's uh, the more saucy dish that is made, basically with the ingredients that I mentioned at the beginning, which is the chilies, which we'll be showing you in a minute. I don't know if you would like me to pick up the camera and do a little panning so you can see some of the ingredients that we have here. Yes, yes. And you show me the, the, and what was that oven in the back? Are you putting a... Yeah, what we have here, this is a typical Guatemalan mask, which is used as a heater. We have it here as a, as a just a decoration today. Okay. And you also see to the right my latest cooking book that I just published. Oh, great. The book came out two months ago, 
It's got 140 dishes, all with this own very colorful picture, 100% Guatemalan cuisine. Uh, it's in Spanish, so if you say if you learn Spanish, I'll be a good book to have. Guatemalan cuisine. Thank you. So go on, so go back to the ingredients. Basically, the two chilies that we use mostly in Guatemala, this is one of them. This is the chile pasa, which is very close to the Mexican pasilla. And over here we have the guaque. For us, it's chile guaque, which the Mexicans will be the guajillo. I think it's called uh, Anaheim or California in the United States, I'm not sure. Uh, we have the green squash seeds here, which comes from a, from a corn, which we call ayote. And this you can toast the grind, or you can cook them and also make a paste. Uh, not like the Italian pesto, but most like a creamy, saucy dish. Uh, we have to definitely use achote in Guatemalan cuisine. Guatemala paste, uh, the achote paste, I'm sorry, is made with the anato seed. And the anato seed then is blended with some uh, natural lard, and that becomes achote paste, which is essential to Guatemalan cuisine much like azafran would be to the Spaniards. We also have, uh, cook uh, cinnamon, which were not, was not used before the Spaniards came, but now it is a staple item in Guatemala and Cuisine as well. I mentioned the tomate earlier, but I also forgot to mention that we also use a lot of tomatillo. You guys call it tomatillo in Mexico, and in, in the United States, here we call it mil tomate, which are, translates as a thousand tomatoes. Uh, also influenced by the Spaniards, Via the Arabs, we use also sesame seeds, which in Spanish is called ajonjolí. That also becomes part of our sauces now. And we not, normally would uh, thicken our sauces using corn dough or cornmeal. But now the typical Guatemalan housewife wants to make it easier, so she'll take some French bread like this, which is <laughs> Guatemalan French bread, they'll dissolve it in some hot stock and then they'll thicken their sauces with that. But that's the Spanish influence, clearly. If you go to the countryside, you'll see people thickening their meals, like the Mayans did hundreds of years ago, using the corn meal or the corn dough. So basically, in a nutshell, that's the little story about the dish that we're doing today. But uh, you'll find different varieties of colors, and different varieties of uh, flavors when you go to the countryside, because there's the pian rojo, which I believe you're making today. Is that right, Chef? Yes. The pepian rojo? Yes, pepian rojo. Okay. Uh, we, here we call it pepian colorado, which is a different way of saying red. And then there's also the pepian negro, which is typical of the uh, Antigua, Guatemala area. And that one becomes black via toasting some tortillas so that they become actually burned. You take also some uh, plantain leaves, which you also burn, and you grind them up into a dust or a brown meal, and that's what makes the pepian black. There's also a green pepian, which comes from the Lake Atitlan area, which becomes green by the addition of some peppers and some uh, tomatillos. So as you can see, when I said earlier that the pepian to us is like the mole to the Mexicans, is because there's a big variety, a wide variety of pepians. You will not only find one. So when you come to Guatemala, which I hope all of you will do someday, <laughs> you have to be, be able to try at least three of them. The negro, which is the pepian, the black pepian, the rojo, which is the red one, and the mixed dough, which is also called pepian indio, or Indian pepian, which to my uh, opinion is one of the best because it uses three different meats. And it's only made in the area of Lake Atitlan, one of the most beautiful lakes of the world. Um, Any questions? Oh, they, there's uh, three meats and the pepian, and what are they? Okay, if you were to make it a native uh, uh, Maya way, you would use deer, you would use uh, wild boar, and you would use uh, tepes quintle, which is a uh, air-eating air mammal. But nowadays, people don't use those because it's hard to go hunting for them. So nowadays, you would use beef, chicken, and pork. We would like to know if your book, uh, if we can uh, buy your uh, cookbook in, here in uh, the United States. Yeah, it can be mailed to you from California <laughs> or from Vegas, where my children live. Okay. And they have a, few, a copies of them in the United States. So what you do is... You send me an email telling me where you want me to ship it. I give you an account number in a Bank of America account so you can deposit and they will ship the book to you. The cost of the book, uh, including shipping, is $85. Uh, can, you, um, can you just tell us your email? <laughs> uh, my, my email is uh, Chef Chapin. Chapin is what Guatemalans are called, uh, like they call American gringos. 
They call us <laughs> So I'll spell it for you. Uh, Jeff, and then C H A P as in Paul, I N as in Nancy. That should spell Chef Chapin at yahoo.com. Perfect. Also, if you want to learn more about the, the academy that we run here in Guatemala, our webpage, you can get into it, is academiaculinaria.net. Academia is written pretty much like academy, except you change the last letter to A. Academia, culinaria, is pretty much the same as culinary, except after the R, you want to do IA. So it's, it'll say academiaculinaria.net. That's our webpage, so you can see more about us, about my books. Mm -hmm. I published eight books so far, but this is the one that I recommend the most because of the pictures. And there's uh, also a glossary, so it explains some of the terms. And if you guys have any questions, when you get the book, you can call me anytime. Okay. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Well, Chef, uh, um, we, um, all of us in Miami Culinary Institute, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule um, and uh, and we love your explanation. We are in love with your foods. We hope that Thank we can you. get to see you in Miami one of these days, and, uh, and we'll definitely do a live uh, demonstration. But uh, well, I'll, be, I'll be glad to do whatever you guys want to do. If you want me to do a live demonstration here, if you want to come and visit you, I'll be more than happy. I love Miami. <laughs> I love the Miami sun, so it'll be my pleasure being with you guys. Well, you're going to be we see with open arms and hands, okay? Thank you. Well, I, I envy your, your uh, studio. It's beautiful. I hope to cook there someday. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to introduce you to Arado, one of my staff. I want to introduce you to, I already introduced you to fellow. This is Winston Alvarado. Okay. Winston is the main uh, uh, teacher here after me. He's the one who helps me run things smooth and it does a lot of the shouting like I do. <laughs> and well, there's the students back there, so you can say hello to them too, please. Wait uh, hi. Hello. They're from uh, uh, first year students. Okay. They're doing French cuisine today. <laughs> And the chef in Miami is Jose Casas, in case you ever want to meet him, okay? All right, there chef, we go. It's been a pleasure sharing with you guys. Any last questions? Are we done? No, that, that should do, but thank you, chef. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm going to end this very much for you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, you have a... See you guys here someday. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you, chef. Bye-bye. This program is brought to you by Miami Culinary Institute at Miami-Dade College. For more information about the schools and the culinarium program, please visit www.miamidadeculinary.com or call 305-237-3276.